Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second episode of Growing Gauteng Together Towards the Next Normal. It is a live broadcast and a webinar. My name is Fifi Peters. The topic for today's discussion is the role of infrastructure technology and logistics towards that next normal. It's a simple equation. More infrastructure development does equal more economic growth. And Africa does have a compelling case for accelerating infrastructure development with major current deficits in the power generation water and sanitation, as well as the transport sectors. On the one hand, Africa's vast infrastructure deficit, which does run into the billions of dollars, is a hindrance to growth. But on the other, it, re it presents an opportunity to leapfrog new and more efficient technologies to close the gap. Over the next hour, we will hear from the Gauteng MEC for Economic Development, two players in the infrastructure sector, as well as four panelists. Uh, please also get in touch with us throughout the discussion. If you are in the infrastructure, technology and logistics space, we'd also love to hear your thoughts on how to resuscitate this very vital sector for South Africa's economy. Before I introduce you to our panelists today, let me introduce Murakane Musupie, who is Gauteng's MEC for Economic Development, Agriculture and Environment, and she will make a short statement. The role of uh, infrastructure towards the new normal. Um, investing in infrastructure is an essential enabler for promoting diversified and exclusive growth in South Africa, not only in the province um, and the continent as well. The attainment of economic growth and socio-economic mobility of our people depends largely on creating a society with sound economic infrastructure facilitation to aid commerce through the provision of power as in electricity, comprehensive road, rail and sea connectivity. This approach is in line with the seven priorities as set out uh, by the Premier in the GGT 2030 vision, which is a policy document for our province, the province of Gauteng. Um, this is with particular reference to the second priority in the GGT 2030 um, um, uh, policy document, which states that the economy, jobs and infrastructure, which aims to create a growing, labor-absorbing, inclusive, innovative, sustainable and globally competitive economy. This vision identifies the following apex deliverables as drivers of recovery in the next normal. There's four main pillars. The first one is reindustrialization of the Gauteng for the 21st century through multi-tier SEZs and high growth sector programs. The SEZs being the apex, most apex um, pillar. The second pillar is creating the enabling, en enabling conditions for a high growth economy through catalytic infrastructure programs. These are driven mainly by DID, which is a um, one of our main um, departments in terms of infrastructure development in the province. The third pillar is bringing opportunities to the many and, and, and confront equality at the spatial level through the township economic development policy and township economic revitalization strategy. These two strategies were adopted by EXCO already, so they are in the process of implementation already. So the last pillar is systematically confront youth economic inclusion through the TEPA 1 million program and youth uh, workforce program. It's one program basically with um, two sub pillars. As we play our role in this industrialization drive, we will be implementing an, an infrastructure driven multi tier special economic zone uh, program in order to transform Houting into a single multi-tier integrated special economic zone in line with our city region approach. Through prioritizing this approach, our SEZ program will roll out economic infrastructure throughout the corridors of Houghton that will crystallize and concentrate manufacturing, grow exports into strategic markets such as BRICS, Southeast Asia, Western Europe, and drive inter-Africa trade, and of course, most importantly, create much needed jobs. These SEZs uh, will help us to advance economic transformation and dismantle the monopolistic 
high concentration levels or across the various sectors of our economy by unlocking the value chains of big multinational corporations to local suppliers. Uh, I think here I should also uh, highlight the fact that in the last sitting of EXCO, uh, our strategy on local content was also adopted. So the plans, we adopted the strategy and plans in that direction. So we are going to start implementing in the next two weeks. Um, and we, are, we're, we as Gauteng, the entire province, are actually very excited about the, the fact that EXCO has adopted this uh, strategy and plan. Through the Gauteng uh, GGDA agency, the agency that actually you will be talking to, the, the GCEO is going to form part of the panel today. SEZ will be rolled out in critical and strategic regions uh, of Gauteng to address the issues of spatial misalignment in the economic development of the province. GGDA has a lot of work to do in terms of making this a reality and we are confident that they'll be able to carry, her, carry it out. Work on the 20 ACZ is already underway in the Northern Corridor. We will be rolling out an ACZ focused on high tech and advanced manufacturing in the east, uh, in still the Northern Corridor, the east of the Northern Corridor in Bronco Strait. It's going to be a very high tech ACZ and we're all looking forward to doing it. We'll also be doing it in partnership with National, the National Department. I've already had discussions with the minister in that regard. And the TIH, which is a, uh, the innovation hub, which is a subsidiary of GGDA, will be playing a major role in that, um, in that regard. And SEZ in the Val, Val Triangle is poised to play a significant role in revitalizing the economy in the, the Southern Corridor. Work is also underway in expanding the OR Tambo SEZ in the Eguruleni Corridor. On that note, uh, let's get the conversation going. I would like to introduce you to our panelists for today. Uh, certainly no strangers to CNBC Africa and the broader infrastructure space at large. Nosipo Damasane, the Chief Executive Officer of Prasa Rail. Sabine Dalomo, Chief Executive Officer at Siemens. Mosa Chabalala, Group Chief Executive Officer at GGDA. And we'll also be hearing from Innocentia Mutau, the executive of Women in Maritime Transports. All right, let's get the uh, conversation going. Uh, good afternoon, ladies. Uh, happy Spring Day. It is the uh, 1st of September, and um, I'm looking forward to hearing from you in just a moment. But before that, uh, let's hear from the first player in the infrastructure space, uh, Bongiwe Picha, who is the uh, general manager of AXA, uh, the OR Tambo International Airports. The role of infrastructure in order to catalyze the economy of a region can never be underestimated. And particularly in this case, that being an airport. So if we were to just uh, start to reflect on the logistics side of the business, which is cargo, lockdown was announced at the end of March. And um, in April, once new regulations were passed, we started handling quite a large volume of cargo freighters. And these freighters were essentially moving um, medical supplies, medical equipment, pharmaceutical products, as well as personal productive equipment into the country, as well as into other parts of Africa, given the fact that um, there are some airports in Africa who do not have connectivity to other parts of the world. And uh, in April, we saw that uh, the volumes that we handled, when we compared them to the same period in 2019, grew by 62%. And that therefore tells us that if we did not have adequate cargo infrastructure for the logistical handling of essential goods, we would not have seen the type of results that we did. When we're comparing April 2020 to August 2020 um, and 2019, um, the cargo volumes grew by 101%. On the passenger handling side of our business, the infrastructure that we have is adequate and it, it will be able to take us into the future. 
Currently, we have an ultimate passenger handling capacity of 28 million passengers. Obviously, with the impact of COVID is going to reduce uh, the number of passenger throughput possibly in the next two years. Um, and when we are able to pick up, we'll be able to handle those passengers into the future. The role of infrastructure is one that we appreciate and we invest in it um, by ensuring that we have adequate master plans that are able to look way into the future in so far as what is required. So our future master plan reveals that within the current site, we will be able to ultimately handle 80 million passengers uh, in and into and out of South Africa. And at that point in time, we'll also have a cargo handling capacity of 2 million tons. The next thing to now focus on in the new normal is uh, technology. What is obviously required by, by an airport is to have automated solutions. COVID-19 conditions um, are obviously forcing all of us to now have limited touch points so that the spread continues being minimized. So technology going forward is going to be very critical. It's going to, to have to process larger volumes quicker, uh, but most importantly, safely. The ecosystem itself has no less than 38,000 uh, employees in total. So having the right infrastructure also enables the economy, not only through uh, the ability to have foreign direct investment in a country, but through the creation of jobs within the country. Right now, we can officially get the conversation going, and I'd like to, or well, you've already heard who we have on the panel. Uh, ladies, uh, good afternoon and happy Spring Day to you all. Uh, Mosa, I'd like to begin with you because we have heard from the MEC of Gauteng and the uh, various infrastructure plans on the go that uh, your or department, uh, the GGDA, uh, specifically have been mandated to action. I want to speak to you about you know, how things are going. Is everything on track and to what degree has, has COVID-19 possibly thrown a spanner in the works of some of your plans? Good afternoon and thank you very much. I, I think we view it differently. So of course um, COVID-19 has forced us to pause unwillingly in some of the um, implementation and planning initiatives. But from my perspective, it's actually encouraged us to rethink um, and be a lot more agile and efficient in how we are thinking about rolling out these SEZs and really looking um, into the future and immediately being forced to appreciate that in the absence of very superior technological um, um, capability in our SEZs and how we roll them out, um, we really will not be able to deliver on what we want to deliver on as a GGDA. So technology is critical, but the way we must plan um, and the level of efficiency and speed that we now need to operate at has been escalated. So yes, COVID has caused a, a, a mild disruption, but it's actually encouraged us to, to, to think on our feet um, and, and, and also encouraged us to look out and think about how we partner better with various stakeholders, both in public and private sector looking at the funding models. You know, COVID has shown us all that government does not have enough funds to be able to fund such critical infrastructure projects on their own. So how do we also start going out and funding uh, and finding investors that will assist um, in the funding of these infrastructure rollouts? But also how do we prepare our pipeline of projects that they are attractive enough for investors to potentially consider um, um, investing in as well? Mm. And perfect, uh, which leads us to our next panelist, Nosipo, who has uh, just come on, street, on screen at the perfect time. Uh, Nosipo, just to hear from you regarding the um, infrastructure plans there at Prasa Rail, I know that you are in the driving seat of the turnaround there. Talk to us about uh, your plans for upgrading uh, existing infrastructure, but also perhaps uh, the new infrastructure that you're thinking of bringing to market. How's that going and to what degree has, has COVID-19 potentially taken things off track for you? Good afternoon, everyone. And I think um, <clears throat> on the same view that um, 
COVID-19 has actually given us an opportunity to stop and think. <clears throat> For Prasa, it's actually been a bit destructive in the beginning because when we closed all our lines due to the lockdown, people got an opportunity to actually vandalize us a lot. I'm sure you read on the newspapers and you see on television. But that has not stopped us in terms of what we need to do to actually bring back the infrastructure into train and get our passengers back on the trains. And effectively, uh, Prasa before uh, COVID-19 had already announced that we are going through the modernization process, which means that we're looking at high technology for our stations, high technology trains to actually get give a better service for our for our passengers. We also have had a lot of import um, equipment and trains in the past, and looking very much into manufacturing locally, which is really a catalyst to economic growth as well as job creation. So how we view the rollout of infrastructure now is that we have two streams. We're looking at the modernization process, which is the high tech process for all the corridors that we will not open. We will actually wait and open them when we have fully modernized them with their stations. And then we have the rehabilitation process, which is also opportunity on infrastructure development as well as just economic growth, because we now have to more like build new railways, rehabilitate, and, and, and then get passengers on rail. So yeah, infrastructure development is a huge uh, aspect of what we are about at Prasa to actually get back on track, as well as the fact that you would know that Metro Rail is a short distance uh, passenger rail transport, which looks into the inner cities. And then we also have the long distances, which is cross-border, which then makes us look into the African continent as well in terms of how do we develop our infrastructure and the connectivity across the borders. Perfect, and I, I look forward to hearing more about your plans within your various roles to develop more um, trade and connectivity uh, in the rest of the continent. But Sabine, uh, to bring you in here, really good to catch up with you. And uh, I love that you're here to add your voice as a private sector player because South Africa has been making a lot of noise around the infrastructure space recently. Uh, we've had a, a great a symposium in which a whole a pipeline of plans were put to the table before investors. It's a long pipeline. Line. I'm told 270 odd projects, uh, 55 that are you know almost ready to have have a check behind them. What do you make of the noises that the country is making around infrastructure? And as Siemens, what role do you do you see yourselves playing in the development? Well, I mean, thanks Fifi for having me today, and it's great to catch up with you as well. And uh, Nusipo and Musa, good to see you. Um, you know, look at the at the infrastructure uh, events and uh, the projects which are launched. As you already rightly say, I mean, capital is key, and and to bring up a, a infrastructure project, it always is the request afterwards if you fund it, how it's going to be paid back. So rather it is a service which is you know provided by the government to its population, then it has to be covered by taxpayers' money, and obviously you will know from the finance minister that currently money is in short supply. But uh, if you look at, at other aspects, in particular with Musa, we look into some of the areas where we can have potentially public-private partnerships. But then we also need to understand uh, clearly on how the repayment will be and how the community where the asset will be rolled out is accepting it so that it's not something what later on through uh, variations um, during a course of, say, 10, 15 years, you can't foresee uh, are, are sabotaging potentially the, the outcome and, and the payment period and the success South Africa had. And I think we have in South Africa one great example in the infrastructure environment, specifically in the energy environment, and that is the um, renewable uh, IPP program which was rolled out and where South Africa has been receiving uh, awards because it's the best program worldwide at a one a given point in time and it has shown on how these kind of projects can be can be rolled out successfully as well as for the interest of, of the investor and the IPP. But I think uh, particular around um, infrastructure projects what needs to be considered is also the phase of the rollout and Nosipo uh, spoke to it and, and you have seen it on TV is that you know in the in the midst of, of desperation of individuals um, damage is done to infrastructure which is there to serve the poorest people of the population but unfortunately the need is so big um, that even that what is there uh, for serving these people uh, has been sabotaged and obviously that comes at a great cost to the state and uh, in that case to Prasa.
Mm, mm, mm. All right, Sabine, let us uh, take pause uh, for a moment and actually hear from another player in the infrastructure space, uh, adding her voice to this a very important discussion that is Rosella Dingle, who is the CEO of Rainbow Junction. Rainbow Junction is poised at the moment at what they call a shovel ready project, which means all the enablements are in place. All the permissions have been granted. The, the project is moving in several tranches called townships towards proclamation of these townships. Um, there's a whole lot of them waiting behind the line for permissions to continue with um, uh, infrastructural development and provision of services to install for uh, the townships and then top structures or buildings can start. So because Rainbow Junction is a mega mixed use development at a strategic address in an already densified area, so it's a unique piece of greenfield in a densified area, which they call an infill development, and it's close to city center, just north of the CBD. Um, it has tremendous infrastructural implications. So there's public transport, there's the uh, four kilometers of Arpies River frontage, which is our eastern embankment of our project. And critically, there's a provincial road link that crosses the river called the K14, linking the old Zambezi Drive of Safako Mokato to Rachel de Beer Street. Now, the RP's River project and the infra and the um, bridge, the K14 bridge, those two projects are sitting in the hands of decision makers at the city of Tswane and the Gauteng Roads and transport department. Both those decisions pending when unleashed, and we're expecting positive decision soon, um, will stimulate post uh, COVID economic growth. So um, because they have um, ramifications and implication um, on driving economic growth into a region of the capital city called the zone of choice, immediately then construction jobs are created, operational jobs are created. Interestingly, we've just checked the numbers out because these went to the province and the city of Tswane because of course they use these numbers to also um, motivate for these infrastructural decisions because as the president said, local economic recovery post COVID will be built off the back of infrastructural development. So to make those infrastructural decisions, you need to motivate. So when fully built out over the next 10 years, Rainbow Junction will contribute 84,000 jobs to the Gauteng economy. During construction alone, it's um, 60,000 jobs. So those are profound figures over the next 10 years. In GDP terms, um, during construction and operations over the next 10 years, it'll contribute 1.85% of the Gauteng GDP. Now, those are significant numbers, and that's because it's a mixed-use development. So it stretches from retail to residential to business uses. <laughs> Quite an exciting project there on the go in the province. And Musa, just to bring you back in here, perhaps to speak a little bit more about what the MEC was discussing uh, when she opened uh, today's uh, session. She did mention the, the infrastructure multi-tier system that is on the go uh, here in Gauteng regarding that special economic zone. And I just want you to just uh, give us a little bit more clarity on that and exactly how some of the uh, private sector individuals who are tuned into this webinar can also play a part in in this drive to, to crystallize manufacturing and expand exports as well as creating jobs. Thanks, Bibi. Um, so, and, and I think all the panelists have touched on, you know, the, 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 the way we interweave in all our work, but the Gauteng's objective from a government perspective is to ensure that we um, stimulate our economy such that we can create jobs and we can continue um, to, to, to stimulate our contribution from a province perspective to the national GDP, taking cognizance of the fact that we contribute over 35% um, towards GDP in South Africa as a province. Now, in order to stimulate jobs, you need to ensure that you have sufficient economic infrastructure in place 
to ensure that economic activity can actually take place. So you have the necessary utilities in place. You have the necessary transportation infrastructure in place. You have the necessary telecommunications infrastructure in place. And so what the special um, economic zones do, and from a housing perspective, a multi-tier um, model, is that in all the five corridors of the province, we will have SEZs that have very specific industry and sector focus. So in the Northern Corridor, which is the automotive city um, that will be rolling out over the years, we have the auto SEZ and we're also going to have the high-tech and advanced manufacturing SEZ. So in the high-tech and advanced manufacturing SEZ, the kind of investors that we'd be looking at coming into the, display, into the space are very much people who play in the innovation, science and technology um, 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 sectors. And what we also want to then encourage in that SEZ is that we do uh, we do skills development, skills transfer in the jobs that are um, created in that place. The value chain advantages and benefits are very much sector focused then. Um, in the Southern Corridor, we'll have our VAL SEZ, which will be more of a mixed use um, special economic zone. And again, in that space is we encourage investors, manufacturers, people um, who have uh, projects um, and investors who are coming to the space, whether in manufacturing or other capabilities, to ensure that what they provide and what they produce um, also supports us as a government, because our agenda is a social one, to ensure that we do job creation, skills development, and um, to ensure the MEC spoke about localization. We would, as a country, want to ensure that as we bring, whether it's foreign direct investment or domestic direct investment into our province, we are ensuring that we are also localizing what we manufacture in South Africa. And we are also ensuring that we are able to export it and offer it to the world as well. In the Western, in the Western Corridor, we'd have an agriculture, an agribusiness, an agri-tech-focused SEZ. And so that model ensures that when we can concentrate our focus of economic infrastructure into designated zones, we can also then add to that the investment capability and the investment attraction capability and very much ensure that, like was said earlier, around our community, Sabine mentioned it, how do we ensure that we also include our communities, include our youth, we educate them, we bring them into the space and we help them understand that this is developed so they can benefit as communities as well. It becomes their assets that we're building out. And so it is in their interest to ensure that they correctly skill themselves, the younger people, that they can prepare themselves to get employment in those spaces and therefore protect and ensure that those assets continue to generate necessary jobs and economic advantages. Perfect. And Nosipo, I mean, just to comment on what the current um, expansion and infrastructure drive of the province means for, for, for you. You did touch on uh, the fact that uh, the rail right now is undergoing a huge modernization and uh, digitization process. And we do know that historically uh, state-owned enterprises have been the sector in government that has spent the most on infrastructure. But as has been highlighted by all of you, money is, is an issue at this stage. We don't have enough of it so just as you talk to your 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 plans to modernize and and uh, digitize rail perhaps add where the uh, private sector and people who do have money at this point in time can 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 get involved to partner i think i think basically for us it's a uh, it's static with that going back to basics and just uh, getting the passengers uh, to go to work you know, you talk about economic development and our role is actually very primary to the poor person who actually goes to work to do the work that we talk about. So effectively, that's our first starting point. So our phase one, in terms of what we are doing, is just to rehabilitate the system that we have to actually get people to work. Then the second step is actually looking at a parallel process of the modernization process. And I think the, the private sector has a big role to play on this. The, the private sector, as in big business like Siemens and um, uh, Sabina, Sabina represents, but also developing SMMEs uh, because it's not just job creation that is important in our country, it's also creating and facilitating trade for the small businesses to actually have a place to pay these IDZs, as well as the manufacturing of trains, as well as the infrastructure that we'll be investing in. So, the way we're looking at it is that we will do a parallel process at some point. COVID, as I mentioned, made us take a step back. We got vandalized. So the first step is just to get people to work. 
The second step is to start modernizing. So therefore we are looking into the capital that we already have budgeted for as the public sector in terms of how far can we go modernizing? What supply development programs can we put in place to make sure that the ordinary people can start their businesses and get involved? How do we partner with big business and some of our big suppliers that are already in our, in our, in our system that we're working with to actually develop the skills as well as transfer the skills? So, and then we will actually get into modernization. And when you talk about modernization for us, for, for the rail, you're talking about modernizing the railways. And, and the trains that we're actually operating with in terms of using power as well as speed trains and, and, and new versions of trains and new technology that is actually coming up, which we buy from these big suppliers, where we are looking into to get the benefit of transferring skills into our country to create small, more smaller businesses that can service the localized environment as well as the IGZs. They can actually have a space to play there. And then we're also talking about the construction industry. Because when you talk about modernizing our stations, you're now moving into brick and mortar issues where you actually then begin to actually bring in the build programs in the country, again, to, to partner with the private sector and actually look at how do we develop those. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very broad subject, but the plans, the way we've done them at this point in time because of the COVID and because of scarcity of money, because I've already said that Prosa Rail is part of Prasa and we are on turnaround. So when you're in a turnaround business, you don't just go straight into investing. You first of all try to resolve the problems that you have, yeah. go back to basics. But it, but economic development is at the core of what we do because we move people who actually build into this. And number two, we have all these projects that actually need capital investments that require technology to actually make us advanced in terms of the product that we produce. Talking about the IDZs that were mentioned earlier by the GGDA and the MEC, I think the key issue for us is that there is a whole aspect of localization that is happening in terms of building these modern, we call them the blue trains, in terms of modernizing these trains and actually getting them. So we're creating employment. We're also creating value for people who are actually in business because those are partnerships that are happening between international businesses as well as local businesses and the skills transfer that actually happens there. And one of those partnerships, uh, of course, is the partnership that Prasa currently has with, with Siemens. And Sabine, just to bring you back in here, because I know that uh, Prasa and Siemens have worked together in, in you know, leveraging each other's strengths. And I just wonder if there's an opportunity that uh, Siemens does see in, in, in modernizing other uh, SOEs or helping other SOEs in their digital strategy. And if so, uh, what kind of uh, conditions would Siemens need in order to, to, to throw its, its technological weight um, into our SOE space? Um, yeah, thanks. And, and yeah, with Prasa, we have a very good collaboration. And, you know, just to give you an idea with what we are doing is we are rolling out the signaling for the Gauteng region. And uh, we have a national uh, control center in um, Karlfontein where all the signaling uh, messages from uh, the region come together. And if you ever have time to go there, I would recommend it because it shows actually what is possible in South Africa in particular and Gauteng because because here you see that it's first of the art technology which we have deployed into South Africa. And uh, the nice thing around it is that 65% of all the suppliers uh, to that project are local suppliers in South Africa. And the majority come from the Gauteng region. And uh, we have uh, the signaling manufacturing for the signaling units, but also the software updates. We all do that in South Africa with our own people, which people we have trained, obviously in collaboration with our headquarters, but which we have localized here, which also makes sure that specifically in the context of Prasa, we are able to provide that service here in country without having difficulties to bring experts in. But I do think as we talk about transport, there are a number of activities, like for instance, with Transnet in the ports, but also at the borders. I mean, if you think about, and we had that in the opening statement, um, particular around how Teng and, and uh, how depending are other countries which are landlocked on South Africa having equipment and goods transported in time and cost effective. I think there is a lot of opportunity for digitalization and also having new technology applied and think about the North-South corridor, which in collaboration 
with the Nepal Business Foundation has been as a project launched and where countries have assigned themselves to standards to ensure that goods can flow and people can flow freely cross border for a reasonable price. And I think these kind of environments we need to seek because if you look at at COVID, what it has shown is that we in Africa in particular, we have to stick together because the world outside of the developing countries, they are busy with themselves at this po current point in time. And uh, for the African community, it's important that strong countries like South Africa also provide that kind of solidarity to the other neighboring countries to enable everybody to participate from the benefits which we have potentially here in South Africa. And uh, specifically, if you look at technology, and, and Musa already highlighted that with regards to the townships, if you if you think about the, the crisis of the jobs which are lost within the COVID ep um, epidemic, the, the challenge really is how you engage with these young people, how you bring them into that kind of workforce, how you can give them the skills um, which are technology-based so that they eventually can participate in what we as Siemens and, and other companies are doing. And I think that is a very interesting uh, project which we are currently trying uh, to develop specifically in hopefully the, the southern region of, of Gauteng and, and really incorporate young people into how the province will look like in the future to come. Mm, mm, mm. And um, I will like, or I would like to get to that issue of inclusion in just a moment. I mean, inclusion of, of young people, inclusion of women, and also of communities that everyone has raised. But we've got some questions that have uh, come through uh, for you guys from the audience. And Musa, I'd just like to get your thoughts on this because we are talking about infrastructure, and we have highlighted how it is important to stimulate economic growth. But in, uh, a challenge right now is that some of the infrastructure that is being put in place uh, is being vandalized as Nosipo did highlight and the question then is how is Gauteng and and the GGDA thinking around protecting uh, infrastructure from being vandalized because ultimately it, it ends up being a, a waste and a cost for everyone I'll I'll speak to the question with regards to projects that we actually um, participate in directly as a GGDA where we have a direct mandate. Besides putting in your necessary and traditional security features, you know, whether security companies, et cetera, one of the critical things that we often forget um, as, as, as leaders um, and as we plan out our projects is who these investments are actually being made for. So our inability to take our communities and educate them and bring them along the journey as we roll out these projects, as we roll out the infrastructure, as we plan, is actually a significant weakness on our part. And that's what one of the pr critical things that we are looking at turning around as a GGDA, as we roll out our SEZs, is we must, as we go anywhere to cabinet or to local exco to get our plans approved, we must do the same thing with our communities. Mm -hmm. We need to respect our communities enough and trust that when we bring them along the journey, and we educate them about the benefits of the projects that we roll out, they will actually take custodianship and they will own those projects and protect them themselves. And so we work in partnership. And as we roll them out, we create the jobs, Nosipo spoke about it in the phased approach. So at a construction level um, phase, you ensure that you create job opportunities and job packages for the community. And then as you operationalize the SEZs, you also ensure that even as the investors come in, they commit to ensuring that percentages of job opportunities are for that local community. Because when the community owns it, they will protect it as well. But yeah. that comes with the prior step of educating them. And we must start respecting you know, our communities to that level. It is not only us at this level that needs to understand what is going on. We must filter it all the way down. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's a very critical step. And like I say, over and above the standard um, security features that we have in place. Yeah, I'll leave it at that. 
No, it, uh, perfect, perfect. And I'm going to expand on that in just a moment, but uh, just uh, more questions that have come through. And uh, speaking to the issue of power, uh, power being one of the areas in which we do have uh, the uh, biggest uh, deficit in terms of infra infrastructure spending and across the continent with around 600 million people or so without access to uh, a sufficient or reliable power, no SIPO. So you're talking about expanding your rails and expanding um, the, the systems there at Prasa. Um, to what degree is the energy uh, shortage and the crisis that South Africa is facing a, a hindrance and um, to the degree that it is um, are you talking to uh, stakeholders regarding the planning and implementing to to overcome these uh, current challenges in fact at this point in time I think in business you can't do much without uh, efficient, uh, sufficient uh, collaboration so the, the administrator process as you know that we are under administration has actually created platforms of, of, of uh, integration as well as collaboration with ESCOM. So we are talking to ESCOM in terms of future plans and how we are going to migrate because at certain areas, because of the modalism, we've had to go back to diesel operations. So as we actually now plan to move forward to get into power operations, actually dealing with our substations, fixing them, we can't do that without a discussion with ESCOM. So ESCOM and Transnet are very key to what we do. The provincial uh, government, including the Gauteng, as well as national government, plays a very crucial role in terms of how we plan. So how this whole rollout of modernization and technology advances is going to link to our delivery and our plans is 100% discussed in terms of the plans that are taking place already at Transnet and the plans taking place at ESCOM. Mm. So it's, we're not doing it in isolation. All right. No, certainly good to know, good to know. Sabina, I know that you are also quite passionate around the issue of, of including the, the local community into a lot of the infrastructure projects that get better down and how you also, like Musa, believe that this could also be a, a solution to addressing some of the uh, issues of unrest and, and vandalism that do take place at a community level. As you do speak to that and your thoughts on you know how best a community engagement can be actioned, can you also uh, address the issue of you know with with Siemens in working with a lot of um, entities um, and making their systems or helping to make their systems a lot smarter particularly what we have seen with our transport systems uh, how are you guys also managing the the human element uh, because more job losses is the last thing that South Africa re needs right now yeah, thanks. So, I mean, look, in, in the context of supplier development, we as, as, as Siemens, we level one triple B E contributor in South Africa. And that gives you an idea on how serious we take enterprise development. And, and that means at any aspects, we try to find companies which uh, can fit into our portfolio, um, but also in, in various forms of our business, where they can support us, uh, be it in the project execution or in the supply to services running our operation and that is something um, I'm, I'm very passionate about because it, it will make the difference to to South Africa but you know when you look at the communities the biggest challenge when you go out and uh, specifically as uh, the unemployment rate is increasing so as you go and you take on a station or a power plant wherever there is infrastructure business required then people see foreign people coming in, um, they don't know, not foreign, maybe foreign to the community. And they, they ask themselves, how can I participate? And that is not as easy because often skills level are not there in order to start operating in a very complex environment like what we would do in a power station or at the Raza, Praza rail line. But um, what, what we do is we, we look together with the community leaders to which extent we are able to incorporate them in the work which has to be done. And that is from community to community different because they all have different skills uh, because of historical background and also the demographics within the community. And sometimes with the soup kitchen, which we organize with the women from the community, or it is really having uh, a basic labor or work uh, contracted in. And as Musa said, incorporate them timely so that they have a chance to understand what is going on, then rather bless them with some kind of solution which I might not know and not be aware of. And, and this is really, I think, the, the fundamental change. But I don't want to repeat myself, but that's why 
exactly the work with Musa is so important around the township economies is to really get the skills up so that when you start rolling out a project, you immediately can start sourcing from the communities because you will find the, com the skills in the community. And so they will look after the assets. And that is, I think, a win-win, not only for us as a company, because mm. we need to take security of our staff very seriously, but also, you know, for the state and for the community to have an asset which is working for the desired purpose. Uh, for sure. And uh, just one last note on the issue of, of vandalism and also uh, tightening up security. Nosipo, to you specifically, uh, there's a question that has come through from the, uh, the audience regarding uh, your, your plans to, to protect Prasa infrastructure. Perhaps if you can just elaborate more on how you intend on doing this specifically with the new infrastructure assets. I actually wanted to respond to that question before it was asked. I was just thinking that I wouldn't have done justice to talk about Prasa and the vandalism and not talk about the plans that are in place at the moment. Yeah. And, that are actually, and, and the plans are actually, uh, you take them from, the, from through different levels. There's, a, there's so much we're doing at executive level. There's so much that government interventions are actually beginning to come and to take place to actually assist in terms of this crime. Because as you can see that the, 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 the crime that's happening in Prasa at this point on vandalism has become a national uh, challenge. So effectively, the minister has actually established forums that he will actually be talking about that are beginning to look at Prasa holistically. And, and then we also have, um, sorry, and we also have a situation, so we have one, a situation where the minister is looking into this and, and mm. in an integrated fashion with all the departments that are relevant to that. Internally as Prasa, we have actually gone a different route. We have gone the route of actually insourcing our security so that we get that more, most of that ownership that you require. So we are appointing, we've done the first round of 3,100 uh, security officers that we have appointed in different categories to actually come and assist us. So we're buying uh, vehicles, we're going the route of e-guarding so that we can actually get all the assistance we require. And all of these we're rolling out on time every day because we have no option. So we do not start operations without necessarily putting security. So our strategy has turned into a situation where our biggest investment is in security followed by the actual infrastructure and followed by the actual operations that we can do and then service our clients in that order. And I think just touching on this issue of involving communities, one of the key strategies we're doing in this is that as we are in sourcing, we are appointing people in the communities where they live so that they begin to own the assets. It becomes their problem and therefore they cannot let people vandalize because they're part of this. Prasa has already over the last two and a half years to three started working on a process of the whole cleaning of the stations is actually done by the communities. So we don't outsource it to small businesses only, but we get the communities involved, which keeps them busy, creates employment for them, but also creates a sense of ownership into what we do as Prasa. We're looking into our long distance rail and we're saying that as opposed to us um, in those long distance rail now, uh, providing um, the, 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 the tourism angle of it into the train in terms of hospitality, we actually want to involve the BNBs on the way and every, uh, so that we actually integrate our communities into ownership of our rail assets. So they, they, there's three levels of it. There's the government intervention, there's the executive intervention, as well as there's the community involvement. Mm -hmm. And this insourcing, which is also a job creation strategy that is so needed after this COVID period. Uh, certainly, certainly. Um, uh, one last question that has come through so far, and we uh, continue to welcome your your feedback as the audience members tuned into the webinar. Um, uh, Mosa, now I'll start with you. It's around the specific um, initiatives and interventions that are targeting uh, the creating of, uh, uh, or, or supporting rather, local innovation. And I'd just like to make a point uh, regarding that, in the sense that um, I'm really happy that we're having this panel on the 1st of September. You know, that is not in Women's Month because, um, of course, a woman inclusion in projects needs to go beyond just a special month that has been dedicated for us if we're going to do infrastructure things differently. So, Mosa, just as you speak to the initiatives targeting, you know, local companies, can you just also throw your weight as to, you know, what the GGDA is also doing to ensure that uh, women are, are a part of that equation? I think maybe let me actually start with that is when we were curating today's webinar it was very important first of all to me as an individual 
being a female leader of an organization, but to the rest of my team as well, to ensure that we also start showcasing um, women in the um, innovation space, Sabine, women in, 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 in transportation, critical roles in transportation, mostly poor, um, so that we can also show both the province and the country and anyone actually watching this webinar, that we have very powerful women, smart women leading critical industries and ensuring that as a country, we are going to come out of this crisis and we are going to continue to grow. Um, and when we plan our work, we don't just think about how thing as an example from a GGDA perspective, we do our implementation thinking about South Africa, but the rest of the continent's advancement as well. Um, and so I am very proud of the panel that we have today. Mm -hmm. And I'm very proud of every woman who takes up space, you know, in whatever industries and sectors that they operate in. And I really hope that young women watch today's webinar and recognize that they are represented. And so if you have Sabine and Nosipo in, with, in the spaces that they operate in and influence, they too can aspire to something at that level and actually beyond. Um, but to speak specifically to the question around innovation and targeted um, and targeted uh, interventions, primarily we have uh, our subsidiary, the Innovation Hub, which is located in the Northern Corridor, Twani. And at the Innovation Hub, what we have created is a space for innovators. And here we're talking about from micro, so an individual with an exceptional innovative idea, mm -hmm. all the way to medium-sized enterprises. We have various um, incubation programs that we, that we run. We have various initiatives and competitions that we run and partnerships that we have where we enable those innovators in technology, green economy, um, you know, the blue economy, et cetera, to find space and expression um, to potential investors or to potential clients um, using various mechanisms. But as we roll out our SEZs, and that's why GGDA and Siemens um, are in conversation, is we're also looking at how do we bring closer the kind of innovations and technologies that are not yet in South Africa. Mm -hmm. So how do we ensure that we bring those in and create exposure and ensure that we create supply chain linkages to the work that um, you, um, your organizations like Siemens do? Um, and in that way, we're also creating um, opportunities for SMEs that operate in the innovation and technology space to um, be able to supply various um, goods and services to larger investors and organizations like Siemens. Mm -hmm. um, but through our innovation hub, and as we roll out our SEZs as well, it will be very intentional how we bring SMEs um, into the innovation solutions, whether it's solutions right. around energy um, or water solutions, or even infrastructure deployment solutions. We're talking about security, innovative security solutions. Our SEZs give us the opportunity to really pilot and implement what is being developed in South Africa. All right, all right, uh, perfect. And I imagine that um, a lot of, uh, as you did mention uh, before, uh, a lot of that will um, involve uh, local content as opposed to you know impor importing some of these uh, materials at an arm and a leg. Uh, ladies, we are getting into closing comments. We are um, about to wrap up the, uh, the, the, the panel. And there's a, a couple of questions that have come through which I'm gonna try and weave um, into one. And it is really around funding, um, which has been a, a challenge or a constraint for the infrastructure uh, space um, historically. And uh, Nosipo, if you can just kick off in your, in your closing remarks as well, in terms of your thinking around the degree to which, you know, the lack of funds could, could play um, in, 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 in stopping or impeding some of the infrastructure plans you have on, on the go. Um, and, you know, how potentially you can um, um, move past this curveball. I think, I think some of the key issues we must think about is the fact that um, over and above the fact that we, we, we have uh, the, the, the funding challenges as a country at this point in time, there's a space for private sector participation. And I think some of the discussions we're starting in this webinar, when you actually see government talking to the private sector and talking together with the private sector in one voice, and then you begin to ignite some of the ideas that you can utilize that are sustainable in terms of how do we then find programs together going forward. And I think just like the GGDA, we also, like Musa was saying earlier, 
we're also looking at, at how to partner with some of our biggest um, our biggest suppliers. I, I'm sure um, um, she will tell you now, Sabina, that in the projects that they are doing for us, for example, they provide their own security. That already is something in terms of how then do you partner. So sometimes part partnering is not going to come in the form of just funding. It could come in terms of technology sharing, mm. as well as skills sharing and resource sharing. And all of those can actually give you the benefit that you want. So at this point in time, we're looking at, 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 at a government funding because that's what we are reliant on the most, but we're looking very much onto the private sector and how they can actually interfere. And most people would say, if then you are giving the opportunity to the private sector um, uh, in funding to come in, that excludes a big part of the community, which is where the supply development programs that me and Sabina are talking about, because now you begin to actually impose small businesses to link into your suppliers to link into the work that needs to be done as an SOE, which then benefits everybody across the spectrum. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, Sabine, uh, just uh, some uh, final uh, words uh, from you um, as we do uh, start to wrap up this panel. Um, regarding the issue of funding, but perhaps more broadly, uh, the uh, impediments to uh, actioning and realizing some of the infrastructure plans that we have as a country and perhaps a, a solution or two on the table as to how we can get over that. Yeah, for specifically, I mean, look at the at the township economies. There, uh, there is definitely a need for having a first of its kinds and a kind of a, a case study to make sure that it can be implemented the way and how we want mm -hmm. it, and we don't waste investors' funding, but also don't destroy the expectation of of the population living there. Um, that is definitely one part which we urgently need to do first um, because it gives security. But for the bigger projects specifically where you have you know roads electricity rail they by themselves have an underlying financial contribution in the sense of that they have paying customers so hence you have a financial model which you can structure around it obviously you know uh, compliance and integrity and all the issues which we have heard over the last couple of months and which also being divulged within the, in the zonder mm -hmm. commission for instance are obviously um, matters which are a bit of a turn off sometimes for South Africa. But I do believe we are there on the right track as a country. Uh, we're addressing it. Uh, it comes uh, out in the open. And so hence, when you execute a project, you can make sure that these kind of issues are not coming forward. And I mean, for us as an as international company, that always comes along with integrity initiatives, which we will do together with our partners to ensure that everybody understands, you know, what is a conflict of interest and what should you not do in the context mm. of uh, a tender and an mm. award and an execution. So I'm very positive about South Africa. We will fix it and um, we together will be able um, to make it better. Very encouraging words uh, from an international perspective, of course. Mosa, just uh, final words from you. And also, uh, I, it will seem like I'm asking you this question for, for the third time, but it, it, I'm, I'm really not, because there's a keen interest to get involved in the, the, the infrastructure plans of, of the halting economy. And so uh, the question that has come through from the webinar is around you know, uh, the projects, perhaps maybe the, most imp the three most important projects that you guys are looking to roll out as soon as possible, uh, paving way for, of course, private sector participation. Um, Fifi, if I may just start off by mentioning how we, as we roll out our work, are going to ensure that we are very inclusive of, of, of our female population and our, of our youth population is a very powerful tool that government has is its procurement. And the policies that we put in place, even internally as an organization, around how we um, ring fence procurement for women and for youth. Another very important thing that is our role from, from, from a government perspective is to ensure that as we bring on investors and as we bring on, as we roll out our projects, we identify very clearly what kind of skill sets are required and really take the responsibility, whether it's through GGTA and its subsidiaries or other agencies and departments in the province to ensure that we actually start doing the skills development and building the pipeline of necessary skills to be able to participate in and take advantage of the opportunities that will be rolling out you know, between now or that are currently rolling out between now and the next 10 and 15 years. So that's a very intentional and specific policy direction 
um, and implementation strategy from a GGDA perspective. And I think our partners share the same sentiment as well. You know, Sabina speaking about what we're trying to do, or not what we're trying to do, what we will be doing, you know, um, for, for, for our township communities. Um, and then having said that, um, in response to your question, is I would um, I want to highlight three key um, through in, in, in the SEZ model, but three key corridors that you know significant priority in is definitely in the northern corridor, um, our high tech um, SEZ, especially because of what we have now learned through through COVID, is the absence of a very intentional focus and investment in technology and innovation is going to result in us as a country and as a continent really not participating meaningfully in the direction that the world is going. And we're going to continue to be a basket case that is always needing to receive as opposed to a bread basket that can offer in abundance. So that high tech SEZ is very um, critical to us. The continuous expansion of the automotive SEZ still in the uh, Northern Corridor. So moving on to phase two and moving on to phase three. And again, the investment attraction that must go into the space and the speed um, at which we do that is important. And then in the Southern Corridor, which is the Val SEZ, great greenfield opportunity for us as a province to ensure that you know we, 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 we create a thriving corridor again, you know, the Val um, region was anchored by the steel industry very significantly so for many years. And that is no longer the case. And hence you see this, the 56% the youth unemployment in that region. And so again, ensuring that whatever economic infrastructure is required, bulk infrastructure, roads, um, telecommunications, we must ensure that we bring that, those basics in very quickly. And we work with our various partners, whether public or private, to implement those, because then you attract investors um, much easier. You can't, again, expect to bring investors into spaces that they cannot thrive in, and they themselves would incur increased costs in order to you know, run sustainable businesses for themselves. So at a high level, if you ask me which corridors are urgent for us as a GGDA, those would be the corridors. But just to conclude and say that working with partners like Prasa, you know, Nosipo spoke about how does she start ensuring that a lot of what she requires is localized. Those are conversations and those are the kinds of partnerships that we are building to say, how do we assist mm. you? Because this is what our mandate is. And that's what your mandate is. And how do we ensure that collectively we respond to government's agenda economic stimulation, job creation, skills development, empowerment, transformation. Uh, certainly. Thanks. Certainly, certainly, Musa, I agree with you 100% there. Uh, this, this is a very big problem that we are facing and uh, there is no one who can do it um, alone all over the world. But ladies, we are out of time. Um, it has been a great discussion for me and thanks so much for all your insights. Uh, thanks once again to the guests, uh, Nosipo Damasani, who is the Chief Executive Officer at Prasa Rail, Sabine Dal Olmo, the Chief Executive Officer at Siemens, uh, Musa Chabalala Group, Chief Executive Officer at GGDA, and uh, we we were not able to hear from us in, in Essentia Motau, the executive of Women in Maritime Transport due to some uh, connectivity issues, uh, really speaking to the uh, challenge that we also have in that space of investing more in our telecoms infrastructure. Hopefully we will hear from her for um, at another time. Thanks so much for all of your engagement. Um, I know that we didn't get to answer all of your questions. Uh, we'll keep them in mind and pass them on to the, uh, the relevant stakeholders and hopefully get some feedback for you on that front uh, from us here at cnbc africa thanks so much for watching as always it's goodbye for now